Greetings from Oxford, Ohio. I am Nicholas Money, an Anglo-American professor and science writer. I hope that all of you are enjoying this virtual rendition of the Ohio Inner Book Festival. Over the past 20 years, I've published several books that celebrate the microbial world, and I've focused on the biology of the fungi, which is my area of research expertise. In my latest book, The Selfish Ape, I depart from these microbiological concerns and consider what we are in scientific terms, how humans function in nature, and why we have damaged the biosphere. The subtitle, Human Nature and Our Path to Extinction, refers to my view of the inevitability of our disappearance. This book is a lot more uplifting than it might sound from this introduction. The Selfish Ape begins with a look at our unexceptional location in the cosmos, our evolutionary beginnings, um, and then I turn to how our bodies work, how we are encoded in genes, how the embryo and fetus unfold in the womb, how we think and how we die. Following this succinct telling of human biology, I turn to the brilliance of Western science and also look at the resulting destruction of Earth before considering how we should prepare for extinction. Here are two short readings from the book. The first one comes from my chapter titled Genesis, and it's on human origins. From an animal that resembled a sponge in its complexity, we trace our evolution through the acquisition of a mouth and an anus in our marine worm ancestry, to fish without jaws, then fish with jaws, to fish with fins that served as limbs, and on through the amphibians and reptiles to something like a tree shrew, then monkeys and apes. This rich bestiary carried our genes, or genes that would become ours, by cruising the wine-dark seas, slithering over glistening bacterial turfs that clothed the rocky shore, exploring the dense jungles that grew in their place, and, at last, migrating to the rich savannah where we stood upright in the whispering grass, flared our nostrils to inhale the sweet air of Africa, and pondered our next move. The second reading comes from the penultimate chapter, titled Greenhouse. Which begins, The decline of our species was the natural and inevitable effect of immoderate greatness. The story of its ruin is simple and obvious, and instead of inquiring why humanity was destroyed, we should rather be surprised that it had subsisted so long. That's actually a paraphrase of Gibbon from his marvellous decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The unfolding story of Earth's ruination has involved some outstandingly maleficent corporations, yet everyone is culpable and the climatic apocalypse was stamped in our genes from the moment we disgorged from the Rift Valley. We share our impulses for eating and mating with mice and mushrooms, but unlike other organisms, the misfortune of brain power has allowed us to feed and breed in ever-increasing numbers. Besides the environmental impact of the headcount, the luxuries of modern life multiply the planetary damage. Most people want to live like royalty, and as opportunities present themselves, we have an understandable tendency to make life more comfortable. These perks have come at the expense of the gas composition of the atmosphere, thickening the blanket of carbon dioxide and trapping the warmth of the sun on Earth. It is not possible to be sure how far we will roast the planet, nor how fast we will heat up, but warmer we are getting. 
The book has been described by one commentator as an advanced obituary for mankind, which is probably a reasonable view of the, the book. I argue that a sense of grace can come from recognizing the mess that we have made and thereby awakening a deeper appreciation of the rest of nature. I'd like to offer a postscript here um, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. The book was published before this uh, catastrophe. The good news, if you're listening to this, is that you've survived. The less positive news is that the virus and future viruses are unlikely to forestall the end of Homo sapiens for very long. Human numbers took their greatest proportional hit in the Black Death. Around 100 million people died between 1347 and 1351, and the European population may have fallen by 40%. Demographic research shows, however, that the long-term effect on population growth was negligible. The plot of human numbers dips in the middle of the 14th century, and after a century or two, we crawl out of this demographic pothole and the curve rejoins the geometric slope as if nothing had happened. In our time, pandemic disease has the potential to limit fossil fuel consumption and weaken the warming trend. To, to sustain this, though, the disease would need to transform the instinctive behaviour of the survivors. It seems more probable, to me at least, that we will always resume our mischief as soon as humanly possible. Thank you for watching this video. Check out my books through the festival website and if you can spare a moment or two visit my website which is themycologist.com that's themycologist one word for further information on my work. Bye for now.